Again, I am Calvin Williams, and we are super thrilled to have you in this facility. If you've never been here, we would definitely like for you to come back. We're proud of our IRC facilities. I'd like to give you a tour. Um, I want to recognize Beth, Amy, and Nina for putting this uh, presentation on. They kind of show us where to be, and they tell me where to stand and what to say. So they put on they put this together for us. Um, Again, facilities are great here at IRSC, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of Dr. Tim Moore, our president, and also Andy Treadwell, the campus president for the Pruitt campus. They couldn't be here today, so I'm representing uh, both of those fine gentlemen. Uh, IRSC, if you don't know, we're reshaping what education looks like in the work in the, within the workspace. Um, Dr. Moore, on his initiatives, uh, President Treadwell, under his initiatives, we're doing a lot of great things here on the Pruitt campus. One of the things I would definitely like to brag on for them is we are doubling the size of our nursing program. Uh, by fall of 2023, we're going to have all the nursing students here, and we're looking to put out 600 nursing graduates every year. Again, we're going to double that program. Uh, we have $13 million worth of expansion in our buildings F and G on the Pruitt campus, and that's to expand what we can do with simulations. So we're going to do some real high-tech, high-touch uh, training for our nursing students on the IRSC campuses. Partnerships that Dr. Moore and Andy have led are currently with HCA Healthcare and also with Cleveland Clinic. So we're going to train the students and we're also going to help them with the employment once they graduate from IRSC. So we're doing some really great things. Again, I will brag on the Veteran Center of Excellence. We have uh, under Beth Amy and Andy's um, leadership one of 16 Veteran Center of Excellence in the country, and we're very proud of that. We have a grant that allows us to do some fantastic things for our veterans within the community. So if you're veteran students, we're gonna take care of you, or if you're veterans in the area, we definitely provide services there as well. The grant opening for the VCE was January of this year, and we're still expanding what we're doing. We have a full-time advisor, we have a full-time coordinator that actually provide hands-on instruction, hands-on services for our veteran students. And again, if a community veteran comes in and we help them, yes, they want resume help, they want help getting some supplemental services, we'd actually reach out and help them as well. Full-time study halls, I mean, I'd like to invite you over for a tour if you get a chance. Conference center, we work with the Department of Education for a $450,000 grant that allows us to do these type of things. And my job, based on Dr. Moore, is to continue these services and we can extend that after the grant is over. So we're doing some great things. Um, if you ever get a chance, we do veteran huddles. We do some monthly PTSD um, events for our veterans to kind of keep them moving forward and provide that service. I have to do a shameless plug. We have a wall of honor in the VCE, and that's where we have plaques. So if you have a veteran that you would like to honor, um, we can actually give you information on that. I'll just give you an example. My brother is currently a uh, senior master sergeant in the Air Force. I got a plaque for him. I didn't do one for myself. I got my brother, my youngest brother, so I bought my baby brother a plaque. We can give you information on that if you want. And another big issue, an initiative that we have at IRSC is the Promise Program. And if you haven't heard of that, we are providing uh, tuition-free education for students in the Four County area. And as of this morning, we have 3,400 students in the Four County area that have signed the Promise Pledge. And we're actually working on getting those students registered for classes to come to us um, in the fall. So we said at the beginning, there are big things happening at IRC under Dr. Moore and Andy's initiatives. And we're kind of moving forward uh, to help the community get better. So that's our, our plugs, and let's get to the man of the hour. Um, Congressman Mass, Congressman Brian Mass, is in his third term representing the 18th Congressional District of Florida. Prior to his election to Congress, uh, Brian is followed in his father's footsteps by serving in the U.S. Army for more than 12 years, earning medals including the Bronze Star, Army Combination Medal, Valor, the Purple Heart, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal. And while he was deployed in Afghanistan, he worked as a bomb disposable expert under the Elite Joint Special Operations Command. The last improvised explosive device that he found resulted in catastrophic injuries, which included loss of both of his legs. Um, again, I commend you for your service, sir. Um, while he was in Walter Reed, Brian's father kind of gave him a pep talk and said, hey, let's get up and you're not going to be stuck at home. You're going to ensure the greatest service you give your country and the best example to set for your children's children is still ahead. Brian took this advice and to his heart and dedicated himself to finding new ways to serve his country and the community. He's doing a fine job uh, with that. 
In Congress, Bryan strives to serve as he did on the battlefield without regard for personal gain or personal sacrifice. He's a member of two committees in Congress, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, where his priorities include fixing the pressing water quality issues stemming from Lake Okeechobee, and the Foreign Affairs Committee, where he uses military expertise to help strengthen the safety and security of the United States. Brian lives in Fort Pierce with his wife, Brianna, and four children, Magnum, Maverick, Madeline, and Major. Join me as we welcome Congressman Brian Mass to the podium. Thank you. Sir. No, thank you, Doctor. What do you miss most about the Air Force? Uh, travel. Traveling? Yeah. Tra like uh, space aid travel? Or space aid. The, the free trips, I can just go sign up and say I want to go somewhere. They'll take me anywhere I want to go for free. We'll leave it at that. We won't ask you where you want them, where you want them to take you. Thank you for your service. Uh, we've got a lot of brothers and sisters in arms. We're proud of every single one of them. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, as we get into one of the most important seasons that we deal with in Florida, and that is hurricane season, uh, and there's so many different fronts that we need to address issues on that. As was mentioned, I sit on the Committee of Transportation and Infrastructure. One of the subcommittees of the Committee of Transportation and Infrastructure is the, the Federal Emergency Management Subcommittee, so I deal directly with FEMA on that subcommittee, which for my lane, if you're asking me what was being done most in my lane, if a hurricane were to strike our area, it would be directly worth with FEMA for what needs to be done on the ground with that agency in a very real-time way, individual cases, uh, whether for businesses or individuals, homeowners, you name it, um, that's always been one of the, the most crucial supports that we've been able to provide as an office is that relationship uh, to FEMA and uh, that direct oversight of them and making sure that they have the right people on the ground uh, immediately following any storms that come through our area. Moving on to the individuals that we have here today, we have a number of, of great assets in our community uh, that touch so many different parts of what needs to, to be addressed when a storm strikes our area. I'm gonna give them the time to speak. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to, to give this information to our community, both those in person and those uh, that will view this online. It's vital to them and uh, you know, with the, the fact of the matter is when people need that information, they need it now. Uh, because something's happening and uh, there's so many things that we could talk about on this in this season obviously uh, the state of Florida is dealing with uh, just a rash of insurance cancellations at this time that's something that's affecting people uh, you know putting uh, more emphasis on the need to be prepared for hurricane season um, obviously uh, you know we're looking at what could be uh, an active season something that we'll hear more about so in that uh, for all of you, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to come with us. Doctor, thank you for taking the time to, to lend us the facilities. I know Dr. Moore is a hard charger, so he keeps, uh, he keeps you going in, in, in every way possible. He keeps me going too, but we appreciate him uh, giving us the facilities to use. And uh, in that, I'm going to move to our uh, Public Safety Director for St. Lucie County. If you want to uh, begin, is everybody in order here? Yes, sir. It would be easy to go just out in the morning. No, sir. Appreciate you taking the time. Valuable information, valuable asset to our community, and uh, thanks. Thank it's all you yours. I'll let you introduce the next person. We'll go down the line. You have to call me up every time you do it. We'll do it, sir. Fair enough. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Barretta, I'm the Public Safety Director for the San Jose County. Joining me today is Gustavo Vilches, he's the Emergency Operations Center Manager uh, for San Jose County. Again, thank you Congressman for, and your staff for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, discuss some more of the hurricane season, the preparedness that we like to share every year and actually year round, uh, you know, make sure that you always prepare. Uh, we work for the San Luis County Board of uh, County Commissioners, and we like to uh, work with them hand in hand because they value the information that we provide for preparing, especially in the Treasure Coast. So, uh, you know, we appreciate their continued support uh, and you know allowing us to go out to the community and just having all the uh, information readily available for all our residents and visitors. So, a couple of the items that I want to talk to you about hurricane preparedness today is understanding your risk. You know, as we have a lot of people moving into the Treasure Coast. Uh, we want you to understand what the risk or the hazards are, uh, how to prepare, how to plan, uh, how to stay informed, and then Gustavo is going to come up and give you some San Jose County specific uh, information. So, understanding the risk, 
always remember that you are the person most responsible for your safety and those who you love. So what that means is you need to be aware of what hazards surround us. And I know that uh, Matt from the National Weather Service is going to come up and give you some additional information on those. But for the treasure coast and, and looking at uh, hurricane hazards, you know, we have rainfall and flooding. That's the number one uh, uh, killer of uh, during hurricanes. So you, you want to understand what those uh, issues are and how does that affect you and your preparedness uh, efforts. And you have also storm surge if you live out on the coast, Hutchinson Island, you want to understand what that is and how that, does it affect you and your property. Uh, high winds, uh, I know that uh, Chief Barra and, and Major Caesar will talk as far as service uh, when we have a, a tropical storm and, and we have winds higher than 40 miles plus hours, service are, are cut up for the safety of those uh, uh, firefighters and officers. So understand that high winds do have an uh, impact to your property and, and for your safety as well. Tornadoes, um, we always have tornadoes. Tornadoes do occur in this area. I mean, we had a, a, a couple, couple months ago uh, and there was no tropical system out there. Uh, so they do occur in this area. You want to make sure that you have uh, an understanding of the tornadoes and where to go uh, to keep you safe. And rip currents. People may think that the hurricane's miles away and you want to go out to sea. Uh, this poses a, a threat too as well for you and yours if uh, there's a tropical cyclone coming in. So you want to understand those hazards. You want to make sure that you prepare, uh, prepare well, that you plan ahead, and you understand how each one uh, could specifically uh, affect you if there's a tropical cyclone uh, coming in. Another area of, uh, that you need to understand is what are the flood zones versus evacuation uh, zones. Uh, flood zones are uh, mapped by FEMA uh, for the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and you want to understand whether your area uh, falls under a flood zone uh, and take the necessary precautions, uh, precautions for those. Uh, evacuation zones, obviously those are different from, from the uh, flood zones. And those are based on the hurricane storm surge uh, zones determined by uh, the National Hurricane Center uh, based on the ground elevation. So you want to understand for your safety whether you fall in a flood zone and uh, evacuation zone or you know individually uh, which one you fall on. So that's that's one of the key items uh, living on the treasure coast that you want to understand uh, what you fall under. Uh, another thing that you need to understand is whether or not uh, what is a, a voluntary evacuation versus a mandatory evacuation. Uh, voluntary local officials may come up uh, to press conference and tell you, hey, uh, this might be a good opportunity for those who live in uh, historically flood prone areas to evacuate always in mobile homes. We tell them to uh, evacuate uh, and get them at higher ground. This is, this is for your safety. So you want to understand that uh, you're safe and you're at all times. Mandatory, that's, that's basically, there's an issue uh, because the probability of the storm surge is going to come and affect your property. So you want to make sure that uh, you evacuate and that's always going to include uh, mobile homes because there could be a potential loss of life. So you want to understand that, what those, uh, each one of those mean. As we discuss prepare, uh, preparedness, we always emphasize the uh, arranging disaster supply kit. Uh, this is basically a, a group of basic necessity items. Water, one gallon of water per person uh, per day. Food, at least three days of food. Uh, battery power, radio, flashlights, um, first aid kits. So you want to make sure that you have this in a bag, in a backpack, in a, a carry-on, uh, so you can have it safely and readily available uh, to ensure that you are ready to go if you need to. Another area that we always emphasize is prepare your home. How do you do that? Uh, you want to make sure that you have shutters installed around the area, uh, your house. Make sure that your doors are hurricane proof. This is done by uh, having three hinges, and those are subject matter experts that give you those tips. Uh, make sure that your uh, garage door uh, it's, uh, can withstand wind, uh, as well as making sure your sliding doors have tempered glass. That's to uh, prevent the, the issue of impacts or whatnot. Uh, another tip that we always uh, uh, provide to our residents and visitors is uh, set refrigerator or freezer to the lowest uh, or the coldest setting. Uh, that's going to help them uh, help your, your uh, uh, grocery stakeholder should you lose power uh, and pick up and secure any loose items 
uh, in the event, you know, that's a normal thing. You don't want to lose, leave anything out, lose, and it can be picked up and be a deadly projectile. Another big area, uh, thing in our area is prepare your pets. Uh, we have multiple people in the area, multiple residents that uh, are pet owners, so we want to ensure that they're part of your family. You need also a uh, emergency kit for them with water, pet supplies, medication, so that way they're also prepared as well. Make sure you have copies of the uh, medical records as well as, well as uh, crate or pet carriers. Uh, any treats, anything that's going to help them stay secure and stay, uh, stay healthy. Another thing people don't think about is your car. You're going to make sure you have your car ready. There is fuel, you know, has a gas tank full, as well as your battery charge. Uh, you want to make sure that your, your car oil is good. Uh, it's been changed uh, recently and that the wipers and tires are up to date. Uh, take pictures, make sure you have your insurance and registration in a waterproof uh, bag, and also have a bag ready in case you have to leave from somewhere else, you know, you have a go bag ready as well. Another area we encourage our residents and visitors, or mainly our residents, if you own a, a business here, I mean, that's the backbone of our community. You want to make sure that you are resilient. We want to make sure that you have a plan, how you do this. Uh, create or update your business continuity plan. Create an emergency communication plan. Make sure that every employee knows where to call in the event of emergency. Make sure you cross-train your staff. You want to make sure that someone might, might be left behind as far as can't leave the house and go work. At least you have someone there for uh, coverage. Uh, review your business insurance coverage. Uh, identify a backup uh, location if possible. You want to make sure that you can get up and running and bring that sense of normalcy back to the community. And again, keep all your key business documents in place, uh, in a safe place. As we go into our planning phase and how to plan now, make sure that your family has a preparedness plan. Uh, make sure that you discuss as a whole, including your kids, what to do, what are the hazards that could affect you. Uh, make sure that you establish meeting locations, a primary location which is close to your house, and a secondary which is farther away in case you have to evacuate. Uh, develop an emergency contact plan. Again, just like the business, you want to make sure that everyone knows how to contact. Make sure you have an out-of-state uh, emergency contact that could uh, locate you or sh share that information with everyone. Uh, learn how to receive uh, emergency alerts. We have different uh, alert emergency alerts uh, applications such as Alert St. Lucie, uh, and that's going to help you uh, stay with the warnings of, as far as what's going on in your area. Plan how to evacuate. You want to make sure that you know the evacuation routes for your specific county or jurisdiction. Uh, make sure that you consider everyone's needs as far as they have special needs. That uh, you register for the special needs shelter in the respective county, as well as practice this plan with the household. It's, it's not it's not going to do you any good if you have a plan and you don't practice it. So you want to make sure that you have that as well. And lastly, we have stay informed. That's the most important, especially in our area. You want to make sure that uh, you stay informed before, during, and after a storm. Make sure that you have radio and TV uh, throughout the house. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, part of your kit, make sure you have a battery operated radio. Make sure you have a normal with the radio so you know what's going on. Uh, make sure that you have the alerts. Cell phone usually works uh, with text messages and text alerts after the storm, so you want to make sure that you have that. Uh, and make sure that you have all the uh, respective important uh, emergency numbers uh, readily available. So that's part of being prepared uh, is, is that stay, stay alert and stay informed. And now I'm going to have uh, Gustavo provide you a preference information specific to San Jose County. Thank you, Ron. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Congressman, for inviting us um, to be a part of this wonderful panel. Who's going to um, be better, you or him? <laughs> He's probably better than I am on the sure. presentation. Yeah, I'm only going to give a couple of slides here. All right. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for having us here. Uh, basically, what I'm here to mention is that in, in uh, San Jose County, we have 14 shelters. Out of those 14 shelters, 11, 11, 11 of them uh, serve as general population shelters. Okay. One of them is a general population shelter and also a pet friendly shelter, and that will be at Fort Pierce Westwood Academy. We have we also have two special needs shelters. One is located at the Harvard Health Fan Center, which is strategically located in the center side of the county. 
Our backup uh, special needs shelter is the Port St. Lucie Community Center. And so uh, if you uh, or your family members uh, need to be registered in a special needs shelter, please go out to www.cucco.gov forward slash special needs. At a minimum, uh, we open up about four shelters uh, every time we get, we see the danger of a category one storm or two storm coming in. Uh, depending on the strength of the storm, then we do a tier approach in which open up the rest of the shelters. As Ron mentioned, please know your zone, especially if you're in an evacuation zone. So if you want to know if, you're, if you are in an evacuation zone, please go on to our website, which is www.sayucco all together it spells S T L U C I E C O dot the forward slash E O C. That stands for Emergency Operations Center. And so from there, you'll be able to see a lot of our uh, products that we use uh, to keep you prepared. One of them is our Disaster Preparedness Guide. And so in this Disaster Preparedness Guide, it'll show you all the different hazards that we feel are very important and that can become threats to St. Lucie County, as well as how you can maintain preparedness, how you can respond and stay informed and recover uh, after the fact. As I keep mentioning about the tools to uh, inform the public, as I mentioned, go on to our website, which is www.stlucco forward slash EOC. If we have to open up our public information line, our line is 772-460-4357. That spells HELP, H-E-L-P. Also, we highly encourage everyone, right now, right now, is the time to go ahead and uh, register with our Alert St. Lucie mobile app. This is our emergency notification system in which, through uh, uh, the system Everbridge, we send you a text, an email, and a voicemail uh, every time we see threats out there uh, that will impact our community. Uh, to register for Alert St. Lucie, please go onto our website again, www.stlucco forward slash alert, A-L-E-R-T. So that way, you can choose what kind of hazards. Now, I'm always being told, make sure you look at all the hazards and pick the ones that you want to be notified of. Because sometimes they have fog alerts and things like that, and those come out at two in the morning. If you're all okay with that, please go ahead and click on that. If not, you might receive a 2 a.m. alert notice about fog alert. But, please go on to our, our uh, app, because then we send out our, our emergency notifications. Also, follow us at St. Lucie uh, County social media platforms. We have Facebook, we also have Twitter, and Instagram. And so, as Ron mentioned, right now is the time to prepare. Best thing I tell everyone is, when you go out shopping, make sure you buy a few things that's in your shopping list, uh, and then next week, buy a few more items, and before you know it, you'll have your entire list of preparedness items uh, ready in case we get uh, uh, hit by a storm. Okay, and that, I think that's it. That's okay, it. Thank you for Thanks very much. Yes, sir. So when it comes to our shelters, if you could just give everybody a little bit more information on those. Um, you know, been by them numerous times, the special needs shelters and the other shelters. Just what should people prepare to bring? Should they, uh, will there be blankets provided or not? What kind of EMS support at the special needs shelters or not? Uh, I know the Sheriff's Department is here, so they'll talk about their presence possibly in some other places. What kind of temperatures in the buildings? Is it going to be freezing there? Will there be meals? Just a couple of the details that people should know about what they should or shouldn't bring or what they should or shouldn't prepare for at the shelters, both special needs and otherwise. Sure, I'll be happy to. And so the first thing we tell everyone, um, when it comes to planning, put shelters as your last option. It's always better to try to stay with family members or friends uh, so now is the time to socialize, you know, make sure you, you get acquainted because when it comes to an emergency, shelters are not exactly hotels. Um, however, we do provide shelters for those who are unable to stay with someone else. Uh, and so a general population shelter, you probably will expect the American Red Cross to be there. Our St. Lucie County School District staff are available there and they are the ones who provide assistance at the general population shelters. In there, uh, the shelters are usually, uh, well, they are in, uh, in school, uh, in the different schools. And so the different schools are ready to withstand different categories of uh, storm force winds. Uh, the temperature, most likely it'll be kind of cold <laughs> because they, they have to keep them pretty cold there. Um, they do provide some, some uh, um, uh, bedding, but we always request everyone's better that you bring your own bedding. Uh, you only get a small space too. 
and uh, the shelters do provide meals. However, it may not be, be the meal that you may like. So we always encourage everyone to make sure that you bring your own type of snacks or meals, especially if you're on a special diet. For the special needs shelter at the Harvard Elf Fen Center, they do provide pots there as well. And there's, there's a, a respiratory therapist and other uh, special type of, uh, of profession, health professionals that can assist uh, our audiences. But remember, the special needs shelters are for people who need electricity to maintain their health uh, needs. And so also remember, the Fen Center is better to always uh, register first, make sure you go to our website, uh, after you register, we will likely, from our uh, department, send you an alert, send you a message, letting you know when the special needs shelter is going to be open, should we see a threat come in our way. Um, so for sheltering, remember, always bring your go kit, like, uh, like Ron had mentioned, and uh, for a special needs uh, shelter, make sure you register. I almost forgot to mention, our pet friendly shelter too, make sure you register. Right now is the time to do so. At the pet friendly shelter, it's not what a lot of people think. A lot of people think that you leave your pet there and you can go on somewhere else. That's not the case, folks. Uh, we have a people side where we would like you to, and, and a pet friendly uh, at the pet side. So we would like you to come bring your pet. We put the pet on the pet side, and then the owner stays on the people side. So don't think that you're there to just drop off your pets. Um, and let's see, did I miss anything else? I think that was good. Okay. Thank you, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll just introduce myself. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. No, 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 no. I'm good at that. So you're gonna go ahead and Just let me find my all right, good afternoon. I'm Sally Waite. I'm the director of emergency management for Martin County. Thank you, Congressman, for having Martin County in the house today. Yes, We've heard a lot about preparedness and my colleagues um, have told you what to bring and what to do and I was going to do the same, and I thought, you know what, we all do the same thing, really. Most counties prepare in the same way. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what happens when you come back home once you've activated or gone to a shelter. So as you know, we all we prepare for all hazards, regardless. We're not just the hurricane people, but I just want to talk a little bit about it's officially hurricane season. Um, no matter how many storms you see there, it only takes one. So I try not to listen to all the predictions. Sorry, Matt. Um, but again, just one storm it takes, so you just really need to plan for all of them, but just know that you're most likely, we're most likely going, going to see something, especially on this busy hurricane season. So in Mark County, we have evacuation zone A and B. So if there's a forecast for storm surge to be up to six feet, we're going to evacuate um, A and B. For C and D, if we have a forecast for 13 feet, we'll evacuate C and D, and evacuation E is up to 16 feet. And pretty much all of our mobile home parks are part of all the evacuation zones. We do ask the mobile home communities to evacuate. In Martin County, you can go to martin.fl.us forward slash em and know your zone and find out if you live in one of those zones. So while you're doing all that preparing, you know, make sure that you include this as part of your, your plan because you're going to need it when you try to get back into your specific county. Um, in Clark County, we have eight general population shelters, one special needs shelter, and one pet friendly shelter. And again, yeah, you have to register just like you do um, for St. Lucie County. We do have road readiness guides, and I'll leave some in the back. And you can always go to our website at martin.fl.us. Okay, so if you did choose to go to a shelter, and now the shelter closes, so the storm is over, depending on whether you've had a cat one, two, three, four, or five, they're all going to be different. We're all going to have different types of, of damage outside, maybe not if, we're, if we get so lucky. Um, so just know that if you're at a risk shelter, which is not the special needs shelter, just a general population shelter, once the storm is over and we've been given the okay to open the doors, you know you're on your own to go. Um, you need to go to your home. You need to make sure your home is safe if you can get to your home. Um, but just know that we don't just close the door on you. You know, once, once you go back, if you don't have a home to go to, if you don't have power, you can't come back to the shelter. Um, we will you know, always provide a safe place to stay. This could be a tricky decision to make. Fire Station 2 is on Seaway Drive. I was having a face-to-face -face conversation with the captain. I'm saying, it's not that bad here. He goes, yeah, it's fine. I drove less than a quarter mile to the inlet and could not stand up outside my vehicle. 
So within a quarter mile, we're having a face to face, and it was going. I came back and said, "You guys need to start packing up and going." And, and thank goodness we did, because they had to go over the big bridge, et cetera, with equipment. So that's a tough call. When we finally do cease all operations, uh, we haven't enacted based on experience previous storms. Uh, and then wrap with the sheriff's department and Port St. Lucie Police Department, and we'll work with four peers. That is specifically for major emergencies. Somebody has died and there was a witness uh, cardiac arrest, somebody is in imminent labor. Those are the two types of calls that we'll go out on. Anything else is going to get prioritized and we're going to go when we go back to uh, full operations. Um, and who did some, the who determines it? Uh, it's usually the, the incident commander in, in consultation with the fire chief. We'll go back and forth and make a determination, okay, now's the time to uh, cease operations. One of the challenges with it, as the winds continue to, to get worse, we end up running an inordinate amount of uh, power pole emergencies. And we actually get to the point where FPNL's not even answering the phone anymore. We say, okay, we're gonna stop doing at least power pole emergencies and fire alarms. And what we'll do is, our dispatchers will keep a log of it, and if we get repeat calls, we know when we return up, restore operations, we'll go back out there. Now, if there's a life hazard, or if it looks like it's catching a building on fire, we'll make a determination if we need to go out there. And we did during a previous storm have guys working in about 50 mile an hour winds on a structure fire. Um, again, could not wait to get them back in the house and back to safety. And uh, this is the MRAP that uh, the Sheriff's Department works with us on. It's staffed with seven people. Uh, two sheriff's deputies, uh, one to drive and one to watch the other one drive. I never understood that. <laughs> <laughs> the guys are unionized. You guys don't have them. Uh, and about five of our personnel. Uh, there's, they, put, they put a stretcher in the back of that thing, and it will go out in high winds, but again, it's very much limited to significant emergencies. And uh, to be frank with you, that decision is made with the incident commander and me. We're the two people on the phone and say, okay, it's a go. And there's actually a chief officer at the EOC in the telecommunicators room that listens to that call and makes the recommendation that we really need to do this. Uh, the last storm, we had three responses. Um, one was an intimate birth that we saved that young lady's life. But when that crew, I was at the station, when they came back, they said, we're done. That was as bad as it gets. And uh, between the flooding, driving over telephone poles that they could not see, uh, it's, it's kind of gamey at best. But uh, we did put that response in after a previous storm where we really didn't have any type of response capability. Uh, again, this is just a map of the county, and like I said, we carved the county into three sections. One is north of Midway Road, and we take the city of Port St. Louis, Lucy and kind of divide it in half because that's our population center. Um, to give you a little bit of background on how this works, if you're down on 911, well, they'll take that call when we're in the no-go phase. That'll get sent to one of the appropriate divisions that we've set up. That division commander has a telecommunicator that builds up a, a card that we've been using for 35 years. So it's not on the computer. They literally fill out a blue card. The blue cards get prioritized when we resume operations. They take them by prior order and start knocking out those calls. When those calls are finished, then we have to do a site area evaluation. We go to every nursing home to make sure their generators are functioning. They have any immediate needs there. At the same time, our special operations teams and other teams are looking at they started the, the mobile homes and fan out to see structural collapse and what they what, what might have an immediate need. Depending on how bad the storm is, we might be calling resources in from other parts of the state to help us out in that evaluation. There's a couple of pictures from our previous uh, engagements. And I just want to put this up here for a little perspective. That is uh, 2004 in a nutshell. Andrew came through in 1992, I was one year on the job. Then we did nothing until 2004. And I think the first storm was uh, Bonnie that ran across the state, that Charlie ran through the state. And then uh, Francis came through and we activated the EOC. We're on full activation. I was living at the old EOC. The EOC didn't work back then, by the way. Yeah. And one week into it, or 10 days into it, I even ran through the coast. So everything we brought into the county from the state left to go help out with Ivan. And we're kind of by ourselves when Gene came through a second time. So. Within 21 days, yeah, 23 days, we have run through two storms. Uh, both of them were fairly significant. I think we're, we're more hardened today than we were then, because we hadn't had a storm in decades. So by the time a, a year later, Wilma came through, even though Wilma was a significantly stronger storm by, by every measure, 
we had actually less damage because FP Network redone a lot of their wiring, a lot of poles have been re uh, replaced, so, but it's been quite a while since then. But we learned a lot that year. In fact, the following year I was deployed uh, with Hurricane Katrina over to uh, initially Santa Rosa and then over to Hancock County, Mississippi, and kind of see how they got through. But um, we're a real resilient community. Um, we've been through this a few times. A lot of the professionals you see here have been through this uh, probably more often than they like to address. So if anybody has questions, I can take them now. Love to meet you. All right. Well, I'm going to introduce the, uh, the old man that's retiring. This is the uh, major. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, the invitation here. Thank you, Con Congressman, for having me. Um, Sheriff Ken Mascara is out of town today, and also Chief Deputy Brian Hester is out of town as well. And I just want to take a few minutes to go over the response and the responsibilities that the Sheriff's Office has when we have critical incidents. I think it's important to understand that much like the fire district, law enforcement is in, it, in and of itself a disaster response agency. We deal with this stuff every day. It just so happens that when it's a hurricane or a large critical incident that the damage radius is bigger, but the relationships that we have kind of help us navigate through these processes. I've been very fortunate um, in my career to have traveled around the country and done training for Homeland Security and for the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And one thing that is unique about St. Lucie County and the Treasure Coast is that we have strong relationships with not only our city, our county, our state, and our federal partners. And it's those relationships that actually carry us through critical incidents. For example, you know, recently, and I think everybody's heard, and if you haven't heard, you've been under a rock somewhere, but when the Supreme Court made their decision on Roe versus Wade, um, had nationwide implications. And we all saw the news, and we all saw the concerns that were coming out um, on the news about that. Within six hours of that decision being made, there is a federal partner's law enforcement phone call that took place with law enforcement administrators across the United States where I actually sat in on this phone call and listened to intelligence, listened to where the problems are, understood where the problems were, understood what focuses we had in St. Lucie County and in the Treasure Coast so that we could move assets to be able to deal with that. Now, it wasn't always that way. Chief Spira talked about um, back in 2004 when we had the hurricanes. And you even go back further than that, back to September 11th of 2001, communication between federal, state, and local law enforcement was not strong at all. Uh, we did not have good communication. We would send information up the pipeline, if you will, but we didn't get a lot of communication back as to what we could do about potential problems. That is not the case anymore. Um, to, in today's world, and as evidenced by what we dealt with with this National Parkers phone call just a few weeks ago, Within six hours, we were on the phone with national level leaders from Homeland Security, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and, and a whole myriad of federal partners giving us direction, giving us advice, giving us feedback, and giving us intelligence on what we can focus our efforts on. So one of the questions that we commonly get asked, and one of the questions I was asked to address today was, how do we interact with our federal, state, and local partners? We not only do it on a daily basis, but we do it on large scale events such as hurricanes and critical incidents. So I want you to feel comfortable that those communications happen daily and they happen when big incidents come. Um, I do want to fill in some gaps when it comes to the emergency preparedness kit. You all received uh, this um, emergency or a disaster preparedness guide. And on page six, it talks about in there what you can have in your home for your own personal preparedness kit. And although all that stuff is very important, there's a few other things that I'd like to elaborate on that you may want to pay attention to. Uh, the first of which, which talks about um, having your, your personal documents in a waterproof container and accessible. I personally have all of my critical documents, birth certificates, credit cards, um, mortgage documents, our will for my wife and I, extra cash. Um, any critical document, passports, is all in one folder, kept inside of a safe, ready to move to a waterproof container. If we have to evacuate the house for any reason, that one binder goes with me. That has everything in it that I will ever need, um, including cash, because if power's out and ATMs don't work, you're not going to be able to use credit cards. So something to think about. Try to co-locate all of that stuff into one location that you grab one item. If your house is on fire, you don't have time to look throughout your house for your important documents. So try to keep those together in a secure location and in a waterproof location. Another thing that people don't think about and, and when it comes to an evacuation is what do they do with their weapons inside of their house? 
So if you evacuate your home, and thinking logically through this process, you're evacuating because of fear of damage or flooding to where you live at. If you leave weapons behind, you leave those available for other people with nefarious ideas to utilize those weapons. So one side note when it comes to weaponry, if you're registered to go to a shelter in St. Lucie or Martin or any other county, they're not going to allow you to bring weapons into those shelters. Uh, we have law enforcement staff at those shelters for those reasons. But you do have to make arrangements if you do evacuate your house. We recommend making arrangements to put those weapons in the hands of a responsible adult who is going to stay home and safeguard those weapons for you while you do leave your residence. Please do not leave those behind. The other thing I want to point out when it comes to response, uh, personal response, is heed the warnings that the Emergency Operations Center and Emergency Management puts out. If you are in a low-lying area that is prone to flooding, and it is recommended that you leave those areas, please, please, please leave those areas. Most of the calls that we receive at the Sheriff's Office to respond to life-threatening situations are flooding. And just like the fire district, once the winds and the conditions get to a certain point, we are not able to deploy our deputies to save the lives of people who are in peril at that time. And the most common responses we get are flooding areas, particularly along the river, um, St. Lucie River, where it overfloods the banks. And we actually, in the last storm that we had, I believe it was Matthew, we had people who were stuck in their attic and the water level was almost up to the attic. And we had to actually go up and get them and get them out. Um, but we can't do that when the conditions are beyond 50 to 55 miles an hour. The fire district pulls their ambulances and their large equipment back in at about 45 miles an hour because of the danger that the winds provide for those vehicles. For law enforcement, our vehicles are a little bit more low profile, so we'll stay out to about 55 miles an hour and then tier our response back in. If it's an east um, approaching storm coming in on the island, then we'll evacuate the islands first, much like what the fire district does. So again, uh, a heavy word of advice is please heed the warnings as they come out. Another question that comes our way is how does the Sheriff's Office prepare for a hurricane or a large scale incident such as a hurricane? Um, our preparations actually begin in the month of April and May. Um, we prepare, uh, re-prepare, if you will, or redo our emergency management mobilization plan, which calls for every member of the Sheriff's Office what they should do within their respective roles to prepare not only their workstations, but to prepare personally for an impending storm. That gets revised every year, gets published at the end of May for the entire agency to see. And again, it goes all the way from how law enforcement deputies should prepare their cars, to how detectives should prepare their workstations. And don't forget, we also manage the St. Lucie County Jail and the 1,300 inmates that are incarcerated out of the St. Lucie County Jail. So not only are we thinking about what has to happen on the outside and the preservation of life and property in the community, we also have to provide for the safety and security and the livelihood of the inmates that are incarcerated in the St. Lucie County Jail to include power, to include water, to include food. All of those things have to take place and have to take place in advance before the actual storm hits. So we begin again by revisiting our emergency mobilization plan in May. Um, we, be, we also do training in the month of May uh, through our online training portal where we put out to all staff in the Sheriff's Office training that they need to be, uh, to, it needs to be revisited, if you will, um, so that deputies understand what they can and can do, what they should and should not do. Uh, one of the biggest reminders that we try to provide deputies is that their vehicles that we assign to them are not vessels. They are not to be driven through high water. Um, quite a bit of the damage that we sustain as a sheriff's office are with deputies trying to drive patrol cars through high water areas and end up grounding the car out. The car doesn't work anymore. Now we have to send more resources to go get that car out. And then we're out that vehicle. We do have a, a large contingent of high water vehicles. The chief showed you the MRAP, the Mine Resistance Ambush Protected Vehicle. That's a military surplus vehicle that we got from the U.S. government. Um, we utilize that for SWAT call outs for the time being, but we also have no problem um, letting the fire district utilize that to uh, do life safety runs during the middle of a storm. And we actually had, in one of the recent storms, uh, we had a shelter um, incident where the MRAP with fire rescue personnel came to the shelter, loaded somebody up and got them to the hospital when it was too dangerous for our patrol cars to even do that. So it does work out very well. Um, we also work with Martin and Indian River counties on access to the barrier islands. Uh, for those of you who don't live on the barrier islands, um, it is a very important uh, factor for those who live out there 
to get access back to their property, but also for us to limit access because you can imagine the, 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 the rubberneckers and the looky-loos who want to go out and see the damage and see the erosion and see all the, all the sand over on Indian River Drive and over on the beach on South Ocean Drive, uh, they should not have access to that beach. So we spend time and coordinate with Indian River, Martin County, Stewart, and Fort Pierce Police Departments about how to allow access for residents to uh, South Beach and North Beach, and also to allow access for maintenance personnel or other personnel who are going out to mitigate property damage. So those relationships, again, are revisited in the April-May timeframe. Letters are sent to residents on both islands, also into Indian River and Martin counties as well, and we coordinate that from sheriff to sheriff through our Treasure Coast Sheriff's Association. So that's another factor that we do to prepare for the storm. Now, when the storms are coming and we have to look at how specific this storm is going to be, what is the expected impact location, what is the expected uh, wind speeds of this, what's the expected damage, and that really, much like the fire district, determines what type of response we put in place. Uh, for the most part, we have about 344 law enforcement deputies that we can utilize during a hurricane response. Um, when you consider not only our patrol assets, which are only about 100 of the deputies, you've got school resource deputies, which make up about 65 of the deputies, court security deputies make up about 35 of the deputies, and then your ancillary units, the aviation unit, marine unit, canine unit, uh, traffic units, and detectives and narcotics investigators. So we have a lot of assets to choose from and to pull from depending on the specifics of the storm. But generally speaking, in Category 1, Category 2, we aren't even going to to modify our shift rotation because we don't. what we don't want to have happen is have deputies uh, making overtime sitting in the office and not being deployed for any specific purpose. Um, so we try to utilize the manpower that we have available, try to keep them on a rotation because just like you, they're going to have damage at their home, they're going to have personal needs that need to be met as well, so we want to keep them fresh and rotating through. What does change is depending on when the storm actually makes landfall in St. Lucie County, that determines what happens with that shift. So we're usually deciding that within about 12 to 15 hours before landfall that, say, day shift, for example, will be held over through the impact of the storm, through the eye of the storm, and through the backside of the storm. And then once that storm has passed and we deploy to do a quick windshield assessment, do any life safety runs that need to be made, then we start bringing the other shifts in and start trying to develop a, a normalcy to a shift rotation at that point. But it's all determined on the specifics of that storm. We do have the availability for a Category 3 or above or uh, other specific circumstances that we didn't foresee to bring in extra shifts if need be so that we can double the manpower on the street. The uniformed assets that you'll see after a storm passes by, um, you're going to see marked patrol cars all over the community. What you're probably not going to see are the unmarked patrol cars and unmarked assets. Because we want to, not only do we want to provide a visible sense of security for the community, we also want to provide a covert um, operation in the community so that we can catch the looters, we can catch the people who are going to take advantage of the damage and the property damage and so on and so forth. So we have not only visible assets out, we also have non-visible or covert assets that go out and deploy when it is safe to do so, and that's usually about 50 to 45 miles per hour when we can get people back out on the streets. I did mention a little bit about windshield assessments. One of the things that law enforcement and fire does as well is as we uh, mobilize and move out into the community, we are funneling information back to the Sheriff's Office Command Center, which is housed right in the middle of the St. Louis County Sheriff's Office Operations Center. But that information is communicated to our liaison at the Emergency Operations Center, who is funneling that information to all of the people making decisions at the Emergency Operations Center. So it's a, it's a way for the county to get a pulse on where we are as a county, where the damage is, where the flooding is, what is the nature of that damage, and we can get that information through our law enforcement assets that are deploying rather quickly and going back out the community. Another thing that you think might be easy is when we have an impending storm and we're looking at anything above a Category 1, we have to send the aviation unit out of the area um, because the hurricane, uh, the hangar that we store those helicopters in is only slated for a Category 1, Category 2 storm. So those helicopters have to leave the area, so we cannot account for those helicopters immediately following a storm to do an aerial assessment until we bring those helicopters back into the county. Um, so that's one of the things that we have to navigate around. 
So the other thing that I had mentioned was uh, the jail. Um, I did want to put a plug in for that. Um, we do have roughly about 205 deputies that work out at the St. Lucie County Jail. They will deploy two shifts at one time because they don't have assigned vehicles like our law enforcement deputies do. So the thought process is, is that we manage the inmate population for a period of 12 hours. The next shift is sleeping in a dorm that does not have inmates in it, and then they can go and relieve the shift, and that way we don't have to wait for people to have to navigate the flooded waters and the, and the, the obstacles that would be out of the community to try to get them back into work. So the St. Lucie County Jail does modify their operations a little bit and double up, and, and we can on the law enforcement side if the circumstances do indicate that. So hopefully that's a good overview of how the law enforcement efforts respond to a hurricane. Are there any questions that I can answer while I'm up here? Sure, absolutely. 1-800. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Can I just ask, how long, how long are you likely to lose power for? After well, it's been quite some time. I was working also for Francis, uh, during Francis and Jean, and we, I, I know I was without power. Most of the county was about within seven days. Um, it's probably much, much better because a lot of that infrastructure has been moved underground now. Um, but what we tell people from a sheriff's office perspective is expect three to four days to try to be sufficient on your own. Um, and within that time, you'll see that power is starting to be restored predominantly to the larger metropolitan areas where the grocery stores are at and that supply chain is so that you can actually go get food and things like that. Yes? You do your windshield assessment. You also have an app that the citizens can do one also from home? Uh, the sheriff's office does not. Uh, that would be a question for the emergency operations center, either uh, Gus or Ron. It's a big um, deal down south. Yes, uh, we, we do have an app that's available. Um, go on to our website and you can see the app. It gives, it's a quick thing that uh, our residents can use and, and they can uh, notify us uh, through the app and saying whether you have water in your area or you have certain damage in your home. Okay. Other questions? All right, I also have the pleasure of introducing your next speaker, which is uh, Matthew Volkmer from NOAA. He's the NWS representative. Matthew. Thank you. 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 And for Congressman Mass, thanks for inviting the National Weather Service to this for a yeah. event. It's really great to be here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, the hurricane seasonal outlook uh, for this season and also some hurricane preparedness information um, as we go through the presentation here. And again, I'm, my name is Matthew Volkmer. I'm the Science and Operations Officer at the National Weather Service Office up in Melbourne, Florida. So taking a quick look back at the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season, another very active season, third busiest season on record. Um, you can see we had 21 named storms uh, last year in the Atlantic Basin, seven hurricanes, four major hurricanes, had eight uh, storms that hit the U.S. coastline, uh, not as many hitting Florida. The Gulf Coast was a very active area this past, uh, for this past uh, season in 2021. And this was also the sixth consecutive year that we've had above uh, normal season. So it's been a very active period. This was, again, the third busiest season on record. If we look back to 2020, that was the busiest season we've ever seen uh, for the Atlantic Basin, 30 named systems. So this two-year period has been very active, and then back in 2005, also a very active season. So getting right into the 2000, or 2022 Atlantic hurricane season outlook here, uh, we are looking for above normal activity in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, you can see there's a, there'll be about a 65% chance for above normal activity. 25% uh, chance of near normal, and uh, only a 10% chance for below normal activity. And you can see the averages uh, for a typical season there on the right is about 14 named storms, uh, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes. And we're forecasting that to be above normal as we head into the 2022 season. So again, the Atlantic Basin season is gonna run, uh, already started here, June 1st through November 30th. Uh, the peak of the season is approaching as we head into August. Uh, September and October uh, as we come into the next few months here. Uh, tropical storms can occur on or uh, before the start of the season or also after uh, the end of the season. Uh, typically 
or we have recently seen some May storms that have affected uh, the southeast and the Gulf Coast areas. So again, we do have the seasonal forecast there for above normal activity. Again, uh, the reason we're looking for this is we're going to see a continuation of La Nina conditions across the Atlantic Basin. And La Nina is the cooling of the equatorial waters, but it has an effect on the Atlantic Basin. Basically, uh, we have less wind shear across the entire Atlantic Basin, so that's going to allow storms to develop and not get to your depart. And we're also looking for above normal uh, sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic this year, which is going to be another favorable factor. So, And the seasonal outlook is for the entire Atlantic Basin. It doesn't talk really about the landfall or how many landfalls we're going to see this year, but we do see a lot of storms in the Atlantic. Um, probably going to see some of those affect uh, the Gulf and the Atlantic seaboard. And again, to have a bad year, it only takes that one storm to really have a significant local uh, impact for any specific community. Um, this is the tropical season uh, hurricane climatology from 1971 through 2020. Uh, we, we are here in mid-July. Uh, we're basically in the foothills of the, of the season that's going to be ramping up here over August, September, and October. Uh, it's from about mid-August to uh, mid-October is when we see the peak of the season, when we see the majority of our tropical storms and hurricanes across the Atlantic uh, Basin area. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about National Hurricane Center's five-day forecast, track forecast. They put these out every six hours. You can go on the National Hurricane Center website and see the information when there's an active system in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, this is an example from Hurricane Irma back in 2017. Uh, it was forecast uh, as it was approaching uh, Puerto Rico there to be a major hurricane and move up toward uh, Florida in the phase four and five time day time range. So that's really for planning for the EM community and for the weather service as far as briefing our EM partners. Uh, there's a lot of planning that's going on as far as pre-positioning assets and determining, okay, if we have a major hurricane moving toward our area on day four, day five, what are those actions that we're going to need uh, to take locally for the EM community and also for the public to start preparing. Um, another thing I want to talk about with the National Hurricane Center forecast, they do a forecast cone which is a uh, cone of uncertainty of where that system will track in the next five days. So for this cone, typically about two-thirds of the tracks from the National Hurricane Center will fall within that cone um, on average over the, over, the, uh, over the period of record there. And the impacts can also occur well outside uh, the forecast cone. So that's another thing to remember. If you're near that cone, you need to continue to uh, check in with the latest forecasts and also follow uh, the local EM recommendations. Another uh, thing I want to talk about is rapid intensification of systems, which can occur. If you look back at all the Category 5 landfalls that have occurred um, in the Atlantic and the uh, Gulf Coast area there, you can see uh, Andrew back in 1992, the Labor Day hurricane in the Keys in the 1935. More recently, Hurricane Michael in the Florida Panhandle and also Camille were all Category 5s of landfall. But if you look back about three days before those systems made landfall, they were only what we, we say as tropical storms at that time, and they all underwent rapid intensification. So it's very important to continue to monitor um, these systems as they're approaching land areas. You don't want to just take a forecast, oh, I see a tropical storm out there in the Atlantic or maybe moving up toward the Gulf, and I don't have to worry about it because it's a tropical storm. Well, you really need to check in every couple days, uh, especially the days two, uh, day or two, uh, first day or second day before landfall, and get the latest uh, track and intensity forecasts. This is the hurricane climatology return periods for the entire uh, seaboard and the Gulf Coast area. You can see for the Treasure Coast area, typically we have a hurricane return period of about eight years on average for the Treasure Coast and about seven years for Palm Beach County. So this is just looking back at the historical record and seeing how frequent uh, systems are. You can see for South Florida and the Miami area, a little more activity typically in the Northeast Florida has a, has a little bit of, they usually go a little bit longer before they see, see those storms. So I did say that the, uh, you know, based on the historical record, the return period is about seven years for the Treasure Coast, but if you look back at the 2004 hurricane season, that was a very historic year for Florida. We had, uh, Four hurricanes make landfall in Florida. We had Hurricane Charlie, Ivan, Francis, and Jean. They all made landfall during a six-week period from mid-August uh, through late September. Uh, we'll talk a little bit here about hurricane preparedness uh, for the season. Uh, I want to think about, when you think about hurricane preparedness and actions you should be taking, you should be thinking about the preseason 
um, actions that you or your family will want to take uh, before the season and then also as you get into that hurricane watch period and the storm is moving toward your area there's also specific uh, things that you'll want to be thinking about so preseason uh, for the preseason you want to know if you live in a storm surge zone or in a flood prone area so that's what uh, 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 Ron and Gustavo were talking about as far as uh, you know, knowing your risk and vulnerability of your location. If you live on a barrier island uh, or you may live near the river that has in a flood prone area, you really want to know that so that um, you can take action should those hur uh, hurricane evacuation orders go out for your county or for your area. You also want to be able to assemble your disaster supply kit, have that ready before the season, uh, plenty of food and water on hand keep gas tanks full. Uh, also those medicines and prescriptions are very important to have ahead of the storm. Um, so you have those if you need to evacuate. Uh, in the hurricane watch period or right before the hurricane watch period, you may need to take those precautions to strengthen your home, uh, secure your house, put up those storm shutters and make sure that your home is gonna be safe through the storm. Also, it's good to have a written plan, uh, contact, uh, have a contact list of all those you want to contact so you have to evacuate, and also to let them know after the storm that you're, you're okay. Uh, and keep those critical documents with you as well, those insurance papers, uh, your credit card information, accounts, things that you want to take with you that you would need uh, if you have a loss at your home or business and need act ready access to that information. As far as other safety information, there are hazards that remain after a storm, and these are some of the things we don't really think about. You know, we think the storm has passed and all the hazards are, are going away, the hurricane warnings are dropping, but there's a lot of times there's, you know, still power lines down across the area, there's flood water still uh, for certain areas uh, from storm surge or inland flooding. Um, and then after the storm as well, um, you gotta think as far as the safety, uh, some safety tips, uh, generator safety is a big deal. People who um, don't, uh, you know, keep those generators outside or away from the home, there's a lot of carbon monoxide dust that can happen after a storm as well. So, and then as far as cleaning up after a storm, we've seen a lot of fatalities with storms where people, um, you know, the heat stress after a storm can be very, especially for the elderly, cleaning up outside after a storm can be very impactful. So. The heat is one thing, and also to be careful with those uh, outside power chainsaws and tools as well as you're trying to clean up. And it may be best to you know hire a, a contractor to clear out some of that debris if you're not comfortable with uh, using the type of power equipment. So where to go for information about storms? Uh, one of the best sources is the National Hurricane Center at hurricanes.gov. You can get all the six hourly track updates for all the systems out there in the Atlantic Basin. You can also get the tropical, graphical tropical weather outlook that gives you a five-day um, outlook uh, coming up over the next five days, what we can expect as far as systems that may develop. You also want to tune into your local National Weather Service offices. Uh, for the Treasure Coast uh, counties of St. Lucie and Martin, uh, the National Weather Service in Melbourne uh, services those offices. You can go to weather.gov slant Melbourne for the Treasure Coast. Um, in South Florida, um, the Miami office services Palm Beach County. Uh, down into Broward and Miami-Dade County. So you go to weather.gov slant Miami and get information from the local National Weather Service office in Miami. And then also, it's very important to also get that information from your local and county emergency management agencies uh, for the Treasure Coast St. Lucie and Martin counties and also uh, Palm Beach County as well. So they've got a lot of good information. They're gonna be putting out uh, press releases, information on sheltering um, and evacuations as well. So that uh, concludes my uh, presentation. And thank you today. And if you have any questions, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And we're gonna we've got three more speakers coming up, and we're, we're gonna be good on the garbage night. I think we're gonna do it. Okay. And we'll put you guys we'll get you to come on up, and then we said for the garbage night. I think you had something at three. Make sure good. We'll go ahead and get the next speakers up. Uh, Okay, good deal. We're going to bring up uh, Ryan Logan, Red Cross. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I just gave you my, get my presentation up. Um, and we were just actually, this past Saturday, uh, we had volunteers go down to the uh, National Hurricane uh, Center 
they're very gracious uh, to open their doors up. Um, so I would encourage any uh, groups that are able to ever schedule an opportunity to go down there. It's a pretty uh, amazing operation that they have um, to keep it safe. So, um, so I am Ryan Logan. I'm the Regional Disaster Officer for uh, the American Red Cross here in South Florida. Um, Um, and so I think the first thing that's really important for folks to really understand our mission, uh, because I think a lot of folks have a lot of uh, perceptions about who the Red Cross is and, and, and how we're kind of organized. Uh, but the American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. That last part of our mission, I think, is the most critical for people to understand. Um, we do our work because of volunteers. 90% of the workforce in the American Red Cross are volunteers. Um, and we're able to do what we do because of the generosity of the American people. We are not a government entity. We do not receive a penny uh, when it comes from the government as it relates to our disaster cycle services programs. All of that is based off of what folks donate to us throughout the year. So um, I just think it's really important for folks when they see the Red Cross out doing what we do, odds are that person doing that is a volunteer. Um, and we could not do what we do without them. Um, here's just a quick uh, map of our South Florida region. So we cover the 13 counties, um, basically from Indian River all the way down to the Keys uh, and over to the West Coast. So roughly 10 million people. Uh, so we have a lot of ground to cover. So when we think about hurricane season, uh, we have 13 individual counties that we have to take in consideration and each one of them operates a little bit different, um, and so we have to make you know arrangements and planning as it relates to those. If we look at what we do and how we support up here in the Treasure Coast, uh, Martin County, St. Lucie County, you know we meet with our emergency managers um, yearly at least. Um, I really am trusting my team to at least be out there at least quarterly, uh, but we're there uh, to discuss every year what is your plan for hurricane season and how can we support it. Um, and I will tell you, across the area, we only have two counties that we actually will do sheltering, where we run and manage sheltering, prior to the storm. Um, just because of safety concerns, um, again, because of us being majority volunteers. Um, and some other issues, we primarily support the county uh, during their opening of shelters um, pre-storm. But within 72 hours post-storm, the Red Cross has the agreement in all these 13 counties that we would come in and assume the sheltering for that county. And by doing that, that means that we do, that's when we bring in cots, we have the blankets, we've got the meals, we have the snacks, we have mental health, uh, health services, all of that within our shelters post-storm. Uh, but pre-storm, you won't see as many Red Cross folks in the shelters just because most of the counties here uh, have assumed for that responsibility pre-storm. Um, so what is our role uh, during a hurricane? Obviously uh, supporting um, and managing those uh, shelters where we have to manage. Um, we also support with feeding, distribution of emergency supplies, uh, disaster health, mental health, and spiritual care services. Uh, this is a really, component, or a really important component of our services. And I think a lot of times people don't necessarily think about this because it's not as sexy or as glamorous as some of the other parts of a disaster. But, you know, people's mental health is really, really important. And especially what we're seeing coming kind of out of the past two years that we've been dealing with, folks are a little bit more um, impacted or a little bit more sensitive to impacts now than they were two years ago. And so the spiritual care component and our mental health component is extremely important. Our disaster health services as well, as somebody was mentioning before, somebody needed insulin. Uh, our health services folks make those arrangements for folks uh, as well. So if someone says, hey, I need this medication, our health services uh, volunteers will work to ensure that we can actually get those, uh, whether it's medications, whether it's some sort of adaptive technology, whatever it may be that those folks need to maintain their independence, we'll make sure that we can provide for that. We also provide client care and recovery casework, uh, and so this is where 
if the situation warrants, we are able to provide financial assistance to individual residents or individual homes impacted. Uh, but then I think more important than the money is the fact that we really start to focus and work with them on a case by case, family by family plan on how they're going to recover. Um, and you know, I have the uh, fortune to have also worked at, at FEMA. Um, and so understanding, navigating the bureaucracies that are some of our organizations following disaster is really, really tough. And so being able to have a caseworker that really supports and hand holds these families through that process is really important. Um, and honestly, that's where we probably get the most feedback from the folks that we serve is where they're the most appreciative is for the time that we take to help them with that more so than the money that we necessarily can provide. Um, and then we also are at the table when it comes to that long-term recovery uh, support in the community. Um, you know, we, especially here, like our volunteers, we're just as much a part of this community as everyone else. And we wanna make sure that we are here uh, through the duration and we're supporting folks however they need for as long as they need it. So just looking at some of our preparedness, obviously, you know, we follow a lot of the same uh, preparedness uh, recommendations as everyone else. Uh, but just want to kind of give you a couple of uh, ideas on something that you can do. Someone had mentioned earlier about uh, an app. Uh, the Red Cross, we have uh, a couple of different apps that are emergency app and then we have our hurricane app. This is a great thing to just download uh, to have, uh, especially when it comes to the hurricane season, because, you know, depending on where you are, uh, it kind of follows you. And so, you know, it will show you where shelters are open, uh, whether you're here or if you decided to leave here and evacuate up north, it's going to show you where the shelters are that have been opened along the route that you're taking. Uh, but it'll also just make sure that you get the appropriate watches and warnings um, as well. So it's just a great app. Again, pretty easy to get uh, from the Google Play or Apple, or you can just text uh, get cane at 9999 and it'll how to have it come to your phone. And then we also have hurricane preparedness here towards our youth, uh, because what we've learned is if we train the youth, they usually go home and train the adults. And so uh, we have our prepare with Pedro uh, for K through 12, our second grade. And then we have our Pillowcase project uh, for third through fifth grade. And actually the Pillowcase project was born out of Hurricane Katrina, where we were actually seeing large numbers of kids show up at the shelter with basically their stuff in a pillowcase. Um, and so somebody was like, well, you know, how do we take that and kind of build a preparedness program around it to teach kids what to prepare for, how to build their kit, and so that's how that, pillow, that project was uh, developed. Um, and so these are two great opportunities. It's kind of my shameless plug for any of you to get work in the community with kids. We are happy to come out and do these presentations for your charge. Um, and so just let us know. We'll be happy to train the kids. Um, one of the other things that I'll just talk about a little bit, just briefly, around the sheltering piece is, you know, traditionally with, with sheltering, you know, we think about shelters being open for a couple of weeks post-storm, traditionally. Um, for us now, uh, we are planning for shelters to have to be open potentially for months, given just the current state of where we are as it relates to housing and the lack of affordable housing. So folks that may be paying only $1,000 a month now in rent, something happens, you're not gonna probably be able to find something that they can move back into at $1,000 a month. So we really just wanna start managing expectations that sheltering will probably be a much more of a prolonged event in a community than it has been in years past, uh, just because of the current status of where we are um, as it relates to the housing crisis. So uh, as a result of that, our need for more volunteers to support that is obviously increasing as well. So if there's anyone that is interested in joining us as a volunteer, we would be happy to welcome you into the family. So I'll hold any questions because I know we're running a little bit over, but just want to introduce Vincent from uh, SBA. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be tag teaming with Tom from the uh, Small Business Development Center. Congressman Mass, thank you for having us here. I appreciate it. So, the SBA, everybody's heard the Small Business Administration. But our mission for natural disasters is to assist businesses, homeowners, and renters return back to normal operations. 
preserve the jobs, and help families rebuild their homes after a disaster. If you're going to be hit by a disaster, you're going to be trying to get all your EOC stuff taken care of and getting everything ready, but you're still going to have damages. You're still going to have damages that insurance doesn't cover, and you're trying to get that stuff taken care of. That's what we do at the SBA through the Office of Disaster Assistance. We're going to work with FEMA and other federal, state, and local agencies, all the EOCs, and all across the state. If anything was hit in Florida, we work with them and FEMA to coordinate the uh, recovery effort. Uh, FEMA, what they do is they'll set up the recovery centers. The SBA will have people in some of the recovery centers. And what we've been doing recently is just uh, doing business recovery centers for business owners. Most of our applications now for disaster assistance will be online. So if you go to sba.gov, you can find that under the funding options for the sba.gov. There's other information on there. We've got, like everybody else I've talked to you about, we have a checklist and a guide to get yourself back to normal. I'm not going to go over that, but I'll give you two websites for that. One is ready.gov. It's like a 64-page pamphlet for you to check for two checks and all that, and who's going to be responsible for what and, and when and where. And then there's also disaster.gov, which can help you with all the federal agencies put together to help you coordinate your own plan for disaster recovery. That's all out there. Uh, each checklist is different for each type of disaster. We've talked about hurricanes here. We're going to have hurricanes, but as I said, most of the damage is going to be from flooding. So flooding is a lot different than hurricane damage, wind damage versus flooding damage. Flooding damage may not be covered by insurance. So we will offer low interest rate loans for businesses, homeowners, and renters to get back to normal net of insurance proceeds. Now for homeowners and for renters, the people like Red Cross will come in and provide some type of grant money and stuff like that that can also reduce your what we call your unmitigated or your uncompensated loss to help you with disaster recovery. Those interest rates are low interest rate, up to 30 years repayment ability, and as I said, most of them are aligned. Now, how many of you were here during uh, 2004 with the hurricanes coming through? A couple of you. So remember that if you went and tried to apply for an application or, or, or get some assistance, everything was like, go to the recovery center and get all this stuff done. We've streamlined that, noticed that you know, most of the stuff can now be done through an online platform. So you will see that we'll say, please go fill out the application online and we'll get it done, we'll get it queued through and get you processed as quickly as possible. That's all I have. Tom, good. Thanks, sir. Tom Kindred, uh, I serve uh, as the regional director for a very unique and, and uh, powerful small business program here at Indian State College called the Small Business Development Center. I want to thank Congressman Mass for the opportunity. Um, all of uh, the other speakers gave you perspective on personal. Uh, our presentation really is focused on small business. Um, the Florida SBDC, just to give you a very quick background, we are written into Florida's law. We are Florida's principal provider of small business assistance. Um, and again, we are also part of the state's emergency response team after any sort of disaster. Uh, the SBDC provides all kinds of resources and assistance for small business owners and operators. We are a federally funded program through our partners uh, with Vince, the SBA, and through Congress uh, in Washington. Uh, we provide all these services at no cost. Um, uh, and one of those uh, specific uh, tools and resources that we have uh, is um, expertise in disaster preparedness and business continuity, as Ron uh, mentioned, and I appreciate that. Uh, we do this through a team of 12 folks that are deployed across the Treasure Coast. We cover the same footprint that Indian River State College covers. We've got expertise in all areas, including uh, business continuity. Just very quickly, just to give you a little context, uh, we've been in really kind of disaster mode for the last two years uh, in the area of small business. Uh, we call them the COVID years, 20 and 21. Uh, our center has provided over 13,000 hours of consulting services to small businesses. We've helped those businesses get access to over $26 million in capital to, to stay open and keep going. We've also helped connect those small businesses to over $154 million in government contracting. But today is about disaster preparedness. Just like everyone else, we have resources, websites, links that you can go and get uh, disaster guides to help you uh, plan uh, in, in your small business. Um, and again, Ron mentioned business continuity plan. This is actually a service that we will assist a small business owner, take them through the process of creating a, a business continuity plan. Just a couple of quick data points you need to understand. Um, only around 30% of businesses have that continuity plan. 
Roughly about 40% of businesses uh, will never reopen their doors after a disaster. Um, and about 90% of those that don't open their doors uh, after five days will ultimately fail. So this is an important issue for small businesses, uh, like Ron mentioned. So that's what we can do to help a small business prepare for a disaster. What do we do after? We actually have resources and tools also. We have what are called MACs, uh, Mobile Assistance Centers. We have big MACs, we have some mini MACs. Uh, and we will deploy these units after a disaster. Uh, they are basically mobile offices that allow a small business to come. They're completely self-contained, self-sufficient uh, offices. Printers, copy machines, computers, Wi-Fi, we can help small business owners get those applications filled out for those uh, SBA, EIDL loans. Um, this is us actually working uh, with a local bank to help uh, minority businesses up in Indian River County get access to the PPP loan. Uh, just, just again, a little context, after Hurricane Irma, we helped process 52 loans uh, and, and we're able to help businesses get access to about $2.7 million in what's called the Florida Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan. Very unique program in the state of Florida. Um, uh, the governor has a, um, a budget of dollars that he commits after any disaster that's available to small businesses. It's called a bridge loan for a reason. It helps that business bridge themselves to a bigger, uh, longer-term loan like an EIDL. So it, important to understand in small business. And then, of course, uh, again, just like hurricanes, uh, COVID came along. We also helped deploy those EBL dollars. We also worked with local uh, counties and municipalities to deploy their CARES Act dollars. So how do you loop it with us? Uh, we have a weekly radio show called Small Biz Florida. Uh, during disasters, we will constantly be updating small business owners and operators about what's going on in terms of those loan programs. We have a statewide podcast. Same issue, we use both of those channels to get information out quickly. We also have the Treasure Coast Business Magazine. There's some in the back. And during COVID, we use the pages of those magazines to put out uh, information about uh, business resiliency. And uh, with that, um, that's the SBDC and what we do for small businesses. Okay, I'm going to ask my colleague Jim Woodard to uh, present some slides for me. So, first, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Congressman, for having the opportunity to join you today to talk about preparation for the 2022 Atlantic hurricane season. As I stated, my name is Danny Cuomo. Uh, I've known FEMA for almost 17 years now. I'm the director of FEMA Nation Force Response Division. So I have responsibility for an oversight of operations, logistics, planning, the Regional Response Coordination Center, and various subcomponents of these branches, like our Regional Watch Center, our Threat Analysis Unit, the Earthquake Program, Disaster Emergency Communications, Meteorology, Air Operations, and I also have two rapid deployment teams, which we call Regional Incident Management Assistance Teams. A little bit about FEMA Region 4, our area of responsibility is the Southeast United States with a population of more than 66 million people. This is comprised of eight states and six federally recognized tribes with over 400,000 square miles of area to cover. Of that area that we cover, 2,000 miles of that is coastline. So there's a significant amount of support and responsibility that comes with um, the preparation for Atlantic strikes and the Gulf Coast as well. As mentioned by Mr. Walker, last year was the third most active season on record. And although Florida did not have direct hit or major impacts as has happened in the past, we cannot be complacent. Whether you live in the Keys or the Panhandle, coast or inland, all Floridians are vulnerable to natural and man-made disasters and everyone should be prepared. The leading cause of damage from weather disasters are actually tropical cyclones. Next slide. Florida knows this well. Hurricanes Irma, Michael, and Andrew alone caused the state $95 billion in damage. That's a billion with a B. So picture this, in today's dollars, the, co the cost to build Disney's Epcot Center was $1.4 billion. That means the total losses from Irma, Michael, and Andrew is the equivalent of building Epcot Center 100 times over. Those costs are simply not sustainable. And it is why FEMA is committed to helping Florida community become more resilient. 
and its residents better prepare before disaster strikes. Next slide. Before, during, and after disasters, we work closely with the team at the Florida Division of Emergency Management and through them with your local emergency managers and public safety leaders like Mr. Guerrero and various other community leaders as well. And as stated by Mr. Sissio, these relationships have been forged over many years and many incidents, working side by side, helping Florida communities recover from hurricanes, floods, global pandemic, and many other incident types. In fact, earlier this year, Tech Hazard staff from our FEMA Region 4 office visited St. Lucie County for an in-person radiological preparedness exercise with local officials. These are the types of relationships that we need to leverage and, and while we're preparing and responding to that. Our regional hurricane liaison team works with the Florida Division of Emergency Management staff and local emergency managers to refine evacuation information and to improve their existing plans. This helps local and state leadership be ready to anticipate evacuation requirements and refine existing evacuation plans. FEMA maintains commodity and supplies such as art, food, and water at our distribution centers that are strategically located around the country. One of those distribution centers uh, that we use to support the state of Florida is actually here in Atlanta, Georgia. As storms are forecast to potentially impact Florida working with Florida Division of Emergency Management, we will determine where to pre-position these commodities prior to landfall of a hurricane. We have identified these locations so the resources can move quickly to meet survivor needs. In Florida, we've used Homestead Air, Air Reserve Base and Jacksonville Naval Air Station. And there have been times where we've used the State Logistics Resource Center in Orlando, Florida. And this is all depending on the storm track and, and the specific requests that we're getting from the state. Next slide. Disaster response is locally executed, managed by the state, and supported by the federal government. We hear a lot these days about, about climate change and resilience, and FEMA is reviewing all of our programs to see how we can more efficient, efficiently and efficiently execute and help reduce future disaster costs. Resilience from disasters must be more, more than just a buzzword. As communities continue to experience increasing costs from hurricanes, floods, and wildfires, and all of the other incidents that we respond to. Along with NOAA, FEMA is focused on effects of disasters and how we can facilitate change through all of our programs. We are also looking at, at climate change impacts on our global communities and how FEMA programs can help communities mitigate those effects and protect residents. We continue to review our individual assistance programs to find any opportunity that we can help streamline and provide survivors with, a greater, access, with greater access to our assistance. Next slide. All Floridians need to be ready. As Mr. Guerrero mentioned, everyone must prepare in the early days of hurricane season and have the appropriate supplies readily available. You've heard about our, web, our, our web, websites and, and resources that are available like ready.gov that provide useful tips on how to prepare your family, friends, and community. For disaster emergency preparedness tips for individuals with disabilities, you can also go to ready.gov backslash disability. If using a shelter location is part of your plan, FEMA has updated its app now with a text to find shelter feature so anyone can find the closest shelters by utilizing our app. Or users can also text shelter to 43362 along with their zip code to get the address of the nearest American Red Cross shelter during a disaster. Next slide. Although it was previously mentioned, I would be remiss if I, if I did not mention the importance of knowing your risk and plan accordingly. No local evacuation routes and shelters. Have essential supplies such as food, water, medication, and, and many other essential supplies specific to your family needs. Prepare a communication plan and practice the plan. And download the FEMA mobile app or any other app from our federal or state local partners that may assist you with local community alerts. Review your homeowners and renters insurance policy and make sure you are fully covered, including flood insurance. Lastly, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about hurricane preparedness. The most important message that I can leave you with is that the Florida Division of Emergency Management, your local emergency management officials, and the Although we encourage families to prepare early, it's not too late for everyone to get things together and prepare for this hurricane season. Thank you. Thanks.
FEMA. Uh, no, I want to thank all of you. This is a great warm up for me. Uh, you know, moving into hurricane season, you guys eat, sleep, and breathe this on a regular basis. And uh, so thank you for putting out the great information for the community. Um, in that, they're here for the community. They're here to support the community. Um, they know what they're doing. Please uh, heed their warnings. And uh, if you need more information from them, uh, follow the websites, their apps, speak to them personally, call their agencies and departments. And uh, knowing them, I can tell you that they are uh, individuals that enjoy their work. And uh, while they, they uh, certainly plan for the worst, they hope for the best, but they're here for you uh, for anything that you need. So thank you all for attending. And uh, for those that watch this later, thank you for watching. Thank you all.